Okay. So again, we're talking about posterior impingement. It's in the it's generally pain in the posterior aspect of the joint. Uh, but this disease process is pretty much limited to just a high-level overhead throwers, as we'll explain. So the MR findings that we see with this are fraying of the undersurface of the posterior supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons, cystic changes in the posterior uh, superior aspect of the greater tuberosity, and the posterior superior labral tears. And then this is a, an ABR view, which shows a number of these particular findings. So here the 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 arm is above the head uh, in the scanner, so it's kind of extended and rotated. And what we can see is fraying and irregularity of the rotator cuff attachment here to the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity, and a chronic compaction injury here of the posterior superior aspect of the, of the humeral head. Now, this bone injury is in the same location of traction injuries from the infraspinatus tendon, which we see in virtually over, everyone over the age of 30. It's also in the same location where you can get a hill sacs impaction injury. So, uh, uh, but this is, uh, these are overhead throwers. They're younger athletes. And uh, most of these patients do not have anterior instability or, or they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing. This patient, in addition, has a little loose body, which is uh, not part of the, the findings typically. So those, the, there's the bone impaction. There's the cuff fraying there. So uh, here's a 14-year-old baseball catcher with a two-month history of shoulder pain. Uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? Okay, we have two XWs of the shoulder. And in the, there's some... Now this is above the equator, and you can have a little bit of a reset, but in this particular patient, we see some subtle signal change here. Uh, somebody is making noise in the background. Uh, if you're not making Can everyone mute, mute their microphone? I don't hear anything. Uh, could everybody mute their microphone if they're not talking? There's a lot of noise. In Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here we can see a little bit of abrasion and irregularity of the posterior super aspect of the uh, humeral head in that location. And we can see irregularity of the labrum. It turns out that this wasn't continuous with a, uh, a recess going to the superior labrum. This was in a young baseball catcher who's also, catchers are also uh, big throwers. On the coronal images, what did you see, Sahar? You can turn your mic back on. Okay, so there's increasing signal within the, I think it says inference it is. So there's like moderate grade intrasubstance partial tear of the inference when it is. Um, and this is really early posterior tendon. Uh, and these, uh, here, here. Why don't you go ahead and mute your thing? Thanks, uh, Sahar. So the uh, the tear of the rotator cuff is thought to be an overuse injury with chronic repetitive traction injury. <coughs> the the bone injuries here are due in that uh, in the uh, late cocking phase. You get an impaction between the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head and the posterior superior aspect of the glenoid. Uh, that's what produces this bone injury, and that's what produces the posterior superior labral tears and this condition from repetitive overuse and impaction there uh, from the throwing mechanism in the late cocking phase. Uh, of the shoulder. So this is typical of posterior impingement, and it's often associated with the GERD syndrome that we talked about last time. Okay, Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, teenage baseball player, uh, I guess similarly, there's some irregularity at the uh, posterior superior uh, humeral head. Okay. Um, not a getting... Yeah. So yeah, I guess that could be with uh, impingement posterior. 
and then what you also you need some of the other components as well because this alone could just be traction injury but we can also see a posterior superior labral tear with abnormal signal within mm -hmm. the labrum and the displacement of the labrum here uh, <coughs> so he has a uh, of those two components, the next cut shows the labral tear as well as abnormal morphology of the posterior superior labrum. Look at the more normal labrum. This is what the labrum should look like. Here it's all beaten up, uh, and this is due to the uh, to posterior impingement uh, in, this, in this young athlete. So that's a teenager. So that's uh, posterior impingement. Uh, Sam, what do you think of this case? Um, impingement. Uh baseball picture. So, yeah, I think a bit of the same here. You, you have that uh, indentation of the posterior humeral head and the posterior, I guess it would be superior labrum, looks kind of blunted, increased in signal. Um, and then you have probably undersurface infraspinatus partial thickness tearing. Oh, surprise, maybe supraspinatus. Supraspinatus, okay. Yeah, exactly. And also the well-developed musculature here. Very well admitted. So th this was a major league baseball player who had symptoms of posterior impingement, and we can see the same findings here in a higher level athlete. Okay. Uh, Sahar, what do you think of this case? So yeah, we see some action injury in the posterior humeral sensitivities, and there's blunting of the posterior labrum as well. So. Yeah, and here's the Aber view. We can see that there's a little, little tear that posterior superior labrum as well. And this was another case of internal impingement in a major league baseball pitcher. Uh, Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, major league pitcher with pain and weakness. So yeah, there's some edema, the greater tuberosity, uh, deep to the footprint. Uh, looks like there's uh, fraying and partial tearing at the articular surface of the supraspinatus. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, and this is just another example of posterior impingement. Some people also call this internal impingement of the shoulders. So, to hear internal impingement, uh, this is what uh, they're really talking about. So, just uh, several different examples of this same uh, process. Okay. Um, <clears throat> wow. So the the posterior labrum looks torn. There's a a bunch of paralabral cysts, and I I don't see an impaction in the humeral head, but I don't think it's normal really. Um, Well, what do you think of the glenoid? Oh, okay. So the glenoid, it looks like it's flattened, maybe even a little bit, um, kind of. It, it looks like it's fractured, and there's a, a cyst of the glenoid. I see. Okay. Thank you. So, labrum. Yeah. So what we see here is the labral tear. We see the paralabral cysts. We see denudation of the articular cartilage here and subchondrocystic changes. So as John said, there's been a lot of impact and injury to this posterior glenoid uh, and the tear. Uh, but do, do you see anything else here in the soft tissues? Um, maybe a, a tear of the uh, infraspinatus. Looks kind of frayed, I guess. They're... No, a little further back. Maybe. It's torn. You see the tear, um, the fluid signal along the margin. So, so what we can see adjacent to the head of the humerus. So are you talking about back here, John? No, no, go directly to the right now. Over here. No, um, directly in uh, uh, posterior to yeah. the head. In right here. there. So that, that looks to me like it's peeled, peeled off. Peeled off? Uh, you may yeah. be right. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure about that. But the the other thing thing to look at here. Notice that there's a 
a large cyst here. Uh, what space is this called where that cyst is located? Oh, um, the suprascapular notch? No. I don't know. This is the spinoglenoid notch. Spinoglenoid So if you see a cyst in the spinoglenoid notch, what else do you have to look for? Um, muscle atrophy. Okay, so, and if you see here, there, look how well developed the subscap is, the uh, deltoid, but look how uh, thin the infraspinatus is, and it probably has a little bit of increased signal intensity compared to the muscles right adjacent to it. And if we go to the other images here, we can see there's the cyst in this particular area, and if we go to the coronal uh, uh, PD facet, you can see that there's uh, edema within the infraspinatus muscle, uh, which in this case is indicative of a denervation of that due to pressure on the nerve from the, uh, uh, the cyst in the uh, uh, spinoglenoid notch. So this is a paralabral cyst uh, with uh, uh, neurologic changes from impaction of the nerve. And that's important because if you see the nerve changes here, that may be an indication to decompress the cyst. Okay. Okay. Sahar, what do you think of this case? Okay. We have two coronal views. I see some increasing now with the superior labor with muscle paralabral cysts. And there is some increasing now in the infraspinatus. Okay, yeah, there's increasing number in the infraspinatus, so there is neuropathy of the infraspinatus, there's mass effect on the subscapular nerve, apparently from that for uh, labor cyst. And you can see the atrophy here on the side. So this is another case where you have a pre-labral cyst which is compressing the nerve, uh, producing a neuropathic syndrome involving, again, primarily the uh, infraspinatus muscle. Thomas, what do you think of this case? Uh, so we have two axial views. Looks like it might be an orthogram. Oh, and, uh, uh, and the, the reason I pointed these out, now these uh, cysts and so forth, these cysts are all due to posterior labral tears, and they typically posterior superior labrum. And if you have chronic compingement syndrome, one of the risks that these players may have in the future is to develop paralabral cysts there, which can then involve the nerves. So that, that's why you have to be aware of that so you look for it and you can pick it out. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, so we have two axial views um, and I don't see the extra articular biceps tendon in the groove. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. It's probably right here, but uh, that, that's really not, I'm, I'm still interested in this posterior superior aspect of the shoulder. Okay, um, I guess there's an area of increased signal at the posterior aspect of the humeral head. Okay, uh, what, what is this? So, it's a relatively young patient. I mean, it's not, uh, okay. this, it's not very bright. This is the epiphysis, and this is the metaphysis. So what do you think these signals represent? Uh, so, I mean, are we getting some partial volume from the physis or? Well, what's happening, this is the normal fatty marrow in the epiphysis, and this is hematopoietic marrow in the metaphysis. So this appearance is quite common in, in young individuals. You know, if you look for it, you'll okay. see it all the time, and that's normal. So. What I'm concerned about is what's happening back here. Yeah, I mean, the, the posterior labrum looks intact, but the posterior colenoid fossa, uh, there's some remodeling and sclerosis. Uh, and then on the coronal view, yeah, it looks like there's some sclerosis and uh, maybe some cystic change there, uh, maybe from like repetitive overhand. Yeah, so, so this, this is what it looks like when you have a repetitive impaction injury. And in between the impacts, the body doesn't have time to 
heal the subchondral trabecular bone injury, you develop these subchondral, really, osteophytes. In older people, they look like the, the degenerative geodes that you guys have seen all the time. But in young athletes, they can also get these uh, <clears throat> repetitive traumatic injuries, but they look a little bit different, and they're in different locations in the young athletes because the mechanism of the trauma is different. Uh, <clears throat> and this is just due to repetitive trauma. Now, in young people, if you pick it up early enough, if they rest, most of these can revert back to normal. Uh, but if they continue uh, to impact these, they end up with uh, osteochondral injuries and often uh, large defects in the subchondral bone and articular cartilage. Uh, do, do you think the epiphysis uh, is, is deformed posteriorly? Uh, the, uh, of the glenoid? Uh, no, um, the head of the... The humerus? Humerus, yes. Uh, uh, where, where the um, greater tuberosity is. Out over here? Yeah, that, that looks enlarged to me, yeah. You, you, you might be right. Obviously, what John is referring to are uh, uh, changes that we will talk about in other lectures where you can get thickening and... Uh, really a salty harris type one injury of the of the physis here from from overuse and we see that often in young uh, pitchers uh, we'll, we'll call it the little league uh, shoulder syndrome this one i'm not sure john this may be a little bit of asymmetry due to that but but uh, i wouldn't call it abnormal on a regular interpretation Okay, uh, let's see, who did the last one? John, go ahead. Uh, you said chronic, uh, that, that label says chronic posterior superior injury. Injury. Right. right. Uh, that, that, that's not, not, not referring to the head? No, this is referring to the glenoid. Oh, okay. The glenoid here. Well, it looks to me like the, there's there's a connection between that two, I, I don't know. Well, well, well I, I'm, the, I'm the surgeon, so. There, there may, cer certainly, if you have chronic repetitive injury to the glenoid, uh, you, it's quite possible that you could have chronic repetitive injury to the proximal physis of the humerus. By the way, the, the little league syndrome or the proximal physis injury of the humeral head is much more common than these impaction injuries of the glenoid, and we'll talk about those later. So it wouldn't surprise me if he has a kind of a minor uh, injury to the physis here, uh, which isn't as severe as we'll see on others that we'll look at, uh, because it would be the same mechanism that would produce this. In this particular case, I think the glenoid injury is a little bit more prominent. The, the treatment for both is rest. Uh, forever. <laughs> uh, let's see. Who did Thomas? Did you do this one? Uh, that's okay. No, but uh, I can. Let me see. Oh, uh, Pablo joined us. Pablo, why don't you take this one? Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, let's see. So we have um, an axial view here. Uh, PD fat set and. Uh, there is um, there are multi small cystic changes and edema of the greater tuberosity. Looks like uh, that's the posterior aspect. So it uh, looks like, yeah, trabecular bone injury. Uh, maybe uh, could be a um, heel sacs, I, I guess, if there was a <clears throat> dislocation of the shoulder. Yeah, you, you, weren't, injury. you weren't here from the rest of the lecture, but what we're really talking about here is uh, okay. that you see in posterior impingement. And those findings are typically chronic repetitive impaction injuries to the posterior superior aspect of the humeral head, right where you get hill sacs, uh -huh. right where you get traction injuries from infraspinatus, and posterior superior labral tear are characteristic of that syndrome. So what else do you see here? Uh, well, the labrum looks like um, posteriorly it's uh, not there or, or there's increasing intensity. So I wonder if there's a labral tear that displaced yeah, so there's a big uh, label tear, and that displaced mm -hmm. labrum is very abnormal in signal intensity and in morphology. 
So th mm -hmm. this was a uh, Major League Baseball pitcher, and we can mm -hmm. see the typical findings we'd see here in really chronic, severe, long-standing posterior impingement. This was on 10 8 07. Next year, that, that was at the end of the season. The next year, he came back and had symptoms again early in the season. This is July 2nd, 2008, or kind of mid to early season. And what do you see now? Um, now, so uh, let's see. So it looks like the edema is, uh, has decreased, and there's only like a little bit of edema or cystic changes in the posterior tuberosity. Uh, I see that the labral tear is dis still displaced. Actually, the gap looks... Uh, increased uh, fluid filled. Uh, I'm not sure if I can explain. Is there some hyperintensity of the uh, infraspinatus muscle there? Um, uh, sure. uh, nice pickup. Uh, let me show that in just a minute. So you know, what we're seeing is that there's less edema, like you said, because this isn't the end of the season. This, this, he actually had been pitching for the last three weeks uh, because after his first game, he developed pain and couldn't play anymore. They were rehabbing him, finally got another MR scan. But since he's not active right now, he doesn't have that edema we saw before, but we can see the chronic compaction injury here from the mm. chronic posterior impingement and the large labral tear. On the sagittal images, we can see severe atrophy of the infraspinatus mm. muscle. And notice mm. marked hypertrophy of the rest of the muscles here. Uh, and this was a this was a very well known relief pitcher for the Angels at this particular time, and it's interesting. Since then, I've seen this severe infraspinatus atrophy in several other major league ba baseball pitchers, uh, so not all of which have uh, this to compress the nerve, but all of them have had posterior superior labral tears. So my guess is that at one point they had a big cyst that compressed the nerve, produced the denervation, and those atrophy from the denervation tend to be permanent. And then the cyst went away for whatever reasons, probably because the tear was too large to, to have a one-way valve mechanism. And the- uh, can, John, uh, can this be a, a stretch injury to the nerve, to the muscle? Uh, it, I guess it could be a chronic stretch injury uh, that's that's certainly possible. Uh, why would it be just isolated to the infraspinatus, John? Uh, I, I don't know. Pictures are um, weird. Okay. Uh, I guess that's also possible. Uh, it could be a stress, chronic stress injury, or it could have been an old nerve injury from the cyst from a posterior superior labral tear, which then, then resolved and left just with the atrophy. But it's interesting that they can still, even with infraspinatus atrophy, still be very high quality pitchers. Uh, but anyway, so this is, uh, so he really had in stage internal impingement. He was told locally that he really wouldn't be able to pitch anymore, uh, that surgery would not be beneficial to him. Now, well, let me come back for a minute. Uh, he had a tear that went all the way along the posterior aspect of the glenoid. So if it's just superiorly, it might be. Uh, uh, internal impingement, uh, but Pablo, uh, it's common in Major League Baseball pitchers to see much larger posterior labral tears. Uh, do you know what the mechanism might be of uh, posterior labral tears being pretty common in Major League Baseball pitchers? Uh, well, I, I would think that it's what you're describing as posterior impingement, where where the there's a uh, abduction and uh, with a rotatory movement, could that be? An external rotation. Uh, that could be good for the posterior superior labrum, but often we, mm. we don't, we just see it in the straight posterior labrum. And I think the reason mm. for this is that the, the, there, the strength of two muscles are highly associated with the speed of the fastball. Uh, do you know what two muscles those are? Uh, I would think that it's the subscapular and the supraspinatus uh, when no, no, the, uh, during the acceleration phase, or is it more um, the, the, those infraspinatus? Are, the, those really aren't the muscles that are involved with acceleration. The muscles involved with acceleration Pectoral. are the pectoralis major mm. and the latissimus dorsi. So those oh, two muscles that the pitchers spend 
an inordinate amount of time trying to strengthen in order to get their fastball faster. Now, how, how do you strengthen the pectoralis major? By bench press. Oh, I see. A bench, yeah. And, and so that's a, a weightlift uh, injury. Yeah. Then. And a lot of a lot of the and you see it a lot in weightlifters. And mm. people aren't trained to properly do bench presses. And it's what they do to maximize the amount that they can bench press to, to uh, impress their colleagues is that they'll come down and they'll bounce. Uh, they'll kind of bounce off. They'll let their arms go all the way back and then kind of bounce off the labrum and give them a little momentum so they can push and, and, and push a little bit higher weights. And when they do that, what they do is impact the posterior aspect of the glenoid right against the posterior labrum. And eventually mm. that can produce posterior labral tears. So that's the common injury seen in uh, big weightlifters are these posterior labral tears from that mechanism. And I think that's what's occurring here. So anyway, uh, it was recommended locally that he retire and uh, they didn't feel that surgery w would be helpful. Uh, but then he went back to New York and had surgery in the off season and this is what it looked like a year later. He came back and tried to play, but was unable to even get out of the pre out of uh, practice. And then finally, the team did another MR scan on his shoulder. What do you see here? So here I see uh, increased fluid. Um, so we have a coronal and, and an axial view here. Uh, yeah, I think from like 2009. It looks like. Um, I think the labral awesome. tear is still there. It's, uh, yeah, this looks is, like it's a chronic tear. I mean, the, the Bob, borders, the edges are well defined. Bob, Hello? this is an arthrogram. Oh, this is an arthrogram, I see. So, um, yeah, so that's contrast, and it's definitely uh, uh, filling that gap there, the, the labral tear gap posteriorly. Um, not sure. I mean, I still see the labral tear. I'm, I'm not sure I've see, I'm seeing. Well, what else do you what, are those, what are those three dark things? Uh, Anteriorly? Now this is right there. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's been surgery there, so there. Uh, there's uh, anchor sutures there in the glenoid. There you uh, go. So, uh, but I guess but, but I don't know not, why the posterior labrum but, is still. They're, uh, they're not metal, are they? No, they're not metal. Oh, uh, okay. I guess they're the reabsorbable type. Is that? Uh, Ryan. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I still see a tear there, a labral tear posteriorly. Okay. So, so what uh, happened to him? Is it, I guess he got, uh, again, uh, uh, there's a dehiscence or, or there's, a, again, a, a so, re-tear of the, of the labrum. So they repaired the labrum, but as soon as he mm -hmm. went back to bench pressing again and pitching, he retore the construct. He a re-tear. It's still the same, and so it, the shoulder is loose. They didn't hmm. repair the infraspinatus. No, right. Okay, so uh, this is a recurrent tear after, after repair. Wait, I saw the edges of the fine. tear were so uh, well defined. I thought it could be it had some time there, or or is it could still be a re tear even if the edges are uh, smooth. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, yeah, this is a recent tear of the recent tear. Uh -huh. You can see chronic thickening here from the chronic uh, nature of the disease. We'll talk more about this chronic thickening here, and there's some names for the syndromes when this becomes calcified back here that you can see on plain films. But when we talk about the labrum, we'll talk more about that. Okay. Any questions? Okay. See. Don't 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 pitch. No, don't pitch. Right, pitching's it. Okay, so uh, let me see. So this is the end of the impingement lectures. So I'm gonna.